Hello, and thanks for being interested in my presentation. Uh, this will cover the work that we have been doing at Jazur in the last few months, which is focused on the analysis of a particular seismological signal called prompt elastogravity signal, which is generated by large earthquakes and can be observed on seismograms before P waves. In particular, I will show our attempt to recover magnitude and location from this signal by means of uh, deep learning. First of all, uh, what is the prompt elastogravity signal, or PEGS? Uh, PEGS is generated by the gravity perturbations induced by the displacement of large amount of mass during large earthquakes. Gravity perturbations propagate at the speed of light, so this means that PEGS arrives at a given location before the fastest uh, seismic wave, the P waves, and can be observed on uh, broadband uh, seismometers. The existence of PEGS was predicted by theory, but the very first observation of this signal is quite recent and is due to Montagny et al. in 2016 for the Tohoku-Oki earthquake. To have an idea of what the signal looked like, the figure on the left shows the observed and modeled waveform at progressively larger distances from the earthquake uh, source of the Tohoku earthquake. Time is relative to the earthquake origin time and traces are cut at the P wave arrival. A coherent, long wavelength signal is clearly observable before the arrival of P waves at each station and is uh, indicated here by the red curve. The black line is the modeled uh, waveform for the Tohoku earthquake. So it's important to notice three things here. Uh, first, there is a substantial difference between amplitudes for a 9.1 earthquake, Tohoku in this case, the black and the red curves, with a simulated uh, amplitudes for a magnitude 8.5 earthquake, indicated by the dashed uh, blue lines. So this means that PEG's amplitudes depend on magnitude and could provide critical information before the arrival of P waves in the context of uh, early warning systems. Second observation is that uh, amplitudes are very small. This is the, the scale, it's one nanometer per second square which have been reached for the talk earthquake, but are even smaller for an 8.5 earthquake. So this means that observations will likely be very difficult because of the low signal-to-noise ratio. Finally, amplitudes uh, show regional patterns. So this means that to extract as much information as possible about the source, uh, we need to work uh, with an array of stations to be able to record the regional pattern of pegs. PEG's sensitivity to magnitude and the fact that PEGS arrives before P waves has attracted a lot of interest for possible application in uh, earthquake and tsunami early warning system. But what is the detectability of PEGS on uh, real data? So this figure shows all the PEGS observation made so far on uh, large earthquakes occurring in the last uh, uh, 30 years and uh, only six observations were possible due to the low signal to noise ratio. What's interesting to notice as well here is that uh, Strike sleep and deep uh, deep sleep events, such as the uh, Wharton Basin and uh, Deep Bolivia earthquake, uh, show comparable uh, peak pegs amplitude with much higher uh, magnitude but shallow deep sleep events, such as uh, such as Toku. So this means that uh, shallow deep sleep events uh, are not likely to be observed for uh, similar and lower magnitudes unless some sort of stacking is performed, as for the um, 8.8 uh, Maui events, um, which however makes application to real-time early warning system difficult. So in the context of early warning, we're actually interested in this type of earthquake, these shallow uh, deep sleep events, um, which are most critical because they are associated with intense ground shaking and can produce uh, destructive tsunamis. So the purpose of this work is to assess uh, PEGS limits for uh, early magnitude estimation for such shallow deep sleep events. And in order to do so, we rely on uh, deep learning, which has proven to be effective at discovering uh, hidden relationships in the data, or to extract information from uh, coherent signals buried in noise, which is exactly our case. So in deep learning, uh, learning requires training on a large database of example for which the ground truth is known. And once the model is trained, it will be able to perform the task that has been assigned to on new examples. So in this specific case, a model is trained to recognize uh, if an input image is a car or not, which is a classical classification task in machine learning applications. In our case, uh, the input image will be represented by noisy pegs waveforms, and the output uh, will be um, real values corresponding to magnitude allocation. So 
we're going to be in a situation like that in which our input is going to be noisy uh, waveforms and we want to, rather than performing a classification, we want to predict the magnitude and location using the information contained in the whole seismic network. So the problem of uh, estimating magnitude and location with deep learning has been addressed uh, recently for uh, earthquakes data. And um, these works have shown that uh, the location task uh, can be achieved just by using data from one single station. So this is a critical point uh, to be made on deep learning because uh, it shows how um, it has a critical impact on the way we, as seismologists, we, we deal with data and we analyze the data. Before this works, we were thinking that we would require at least three stations to locate uh, an event, but uh, these works have shown that uh, a lot of information is contained uh, in the data and we can do the same task with one single station. In this work, we're going to use uh, a full array of stations to extract uh, the information from the data. So because of the scarcity of uh, real PEGS observations, we can't train on uh, real uh, data and we need to rely on uh, synthetic data. Thankfully, we have computer codes that would allow to uh, simulate uh, waveforms given uh, specific uh, source uh, parameters and we can build a database uh, of observed waveforms. I'm not going through the detail of all the preprocessing steps uh, to build the database, I'll just mention a few points. We use uh, 500,000 synthetic uh, earthquake sources location and parameters. Um, location are uh, chosen according to an existing model of subduction geometry, which is indicated by these uh, uh, green lines at 20 and 30 kilometers depth. Uh, for a given event, we assign a magnitude uh, choosing at random uh, between 5.5 and 10. And we generate synthetic waveforms, noise free synthetic waveforms, for all the stations presented here in the map. To the synthetic waveforms, we add empirical noise. So, um, noise that actually has been recorded uh, to seismic stations to simulate more realistic waveforms. These are an example of uh, what uh, the what the uh, waveforms look like uh, for uh, an example of an 8.9 magnitude earthquake. So the red uh, line is the synthetic noise-free PEGS waveform and the black line is the same with noise, with empirical noise added. Then we arrange uh, all the waveforms at each station in, a, in an image like this one, which has a length of 350 seconds from the earthquake origin time. Here I just cut for uh, display purposes. And um, we set to zero uh, the trace after the P wave arrival time, just to so in this way we would be uh, able to focus only on the information contained in the pegs, just before the P wave arrival time. We use a network architecture which is very simple and it's based on a convolutional uh, neural network where the input are three images like this. Uh, here I show only one, but there are three images, one for each uh, component, vertical and two horizontals. And the output are three values uh, related to magnitude, uh, latitude and longitude. The convolutional part of the, of the network will perform uh, feature extraction, while the last part, which is made of uh, three fully connected layers, uh, will uh, perform high-level reasoning on the extracted feature to come up with an estimate of uh, the three quantity of interest. So we train uh, the database on um, 400,000 examples and we choose uh, 50,000 examples for the validation test set which is used to tune the architecture and the hyperparameters and other 50,000 examples on the test set which is composed by, to just to assess the performance of the algorithm as the test set is composed of examples that has never been seen uh, by the algorithm during training. These are the results of the predictions for magnitude on the test set. Um, I will just mostly focus on magnitude and just mention here that uh, the errors on location are the order of uh, 15 kilometers. Uh, for magnitude, the density plot uh, here uh, indicates that the results can be divided into two clusters. The first cluster is characterized by a one-to-one -one relationship between predicted and uh, true magnitude values here on the x-axis and extends from uh, 10 down to about uh, 7.8. The one-to-one -one relationship uh, is weaker for predicted values between 7.8 and 7, and a second cluster of predictions with almost constant value at about uh, 6.5 of the predicted magnitude can be identified. Uh, 
What this seems to suggest is that below about uh, 7.8, the information contained in the data does not allow for reliable uh, magnitude prediction, but it works very well above uh, that threshold. We can take a closer look at the evolution of the residuals as a function of magnitude. Here, we color each box plot according to the probability of the predicted value to fall into the first cluster, which we know corresponds to the unbiased predictions. As this probability decreases, errors on the predictions increase, as indicated by the height of the box and whisker plot. We know two things here. One is that the probability of belonging to the unbiased cluster is around 50% at 7.7, .7, and it drops below 20% at 7.6. So we can therefore place a limit on the lower magnitude to which the data are sensitive or partially sensitive to, somewhere between 7.7 .7 and 8. Second, the uncertainties of uh, the predictions decreases with magnitude. This is important in the context of uh, early warning, as those uh, early warning systems based on the first few seconds of the P waves are known to produce uh, saturated magnitude values for large earthquakes, let's say above 7. The advantage of our model is that it's able to distinguish between, say, a magnitude 8 and a magnitude 9, which still represents a challenge for point source uh, algorithms employed in uh, some of the existing early warning systems. But ultimately, what we're really interested in is the performance of the model when the true magnitude is not known. We can have a different view of the prediction capabilities of the model by computing the probability that a predicted magnitude is above a given magnitude. These images provide guidelines for the interpretation of the predictions of our model and can guide the decisions in the context of early warning applications. We can draw isoprobability lines to identify robust predictions up to the desired level of confidence. So for example, imagine that the model is fed with new real data and predicts nine. So this figure is saying that there is a 100% probability that the true magnitude of the earthquake is above, let's say, eight. So to better illustrate this concept, we can cut the image in horizontal slices as is done here, and fix a value of probability for which we would be willing to take action in the context of early warning, let's say 90%. Um, the figure on the right here then show this for four different predicted magnitude values, uh, 7.5, 8, 8.5, and 9. And for each of the predicted values, we can read on the x-axis what is the minimum magnitude to be expected with a probability of uh, 90%. So if the algorithm predicts uh, 8.5, these values correspond to 7.9. Uh, finally, we tested our model on real data, and these are the results for magnitude for Toku. On the left, you can see the probability distribution of the results, which is obtained by predicting magnitude a thousand times, while randomly muting some of the model parameters and combining all the results. This approximates uh, the posterior probability distribution and gives an idea about the uncertainties on the predicted magnitude. As you can see, the model predicts the true magnitude of 9.1, indicated by the red line, uh, pretty well, as the mean of the distribution is about 9.2 and the standard deviation is uh, 0.13. We also tried to predict the magnitude for a relatively smaller event, such as the 8.1-8.2 Hokkaido event. Although the results are not as good as with Toku and uncertainties are higher, uh, the model is able to recognize that this earthquake has a significant magnitude. Uh, the mean value is biased toward lower values as the dis posterior distribution is slightly negatively skewed. Overall, uh, this confirms uh, what observed on the test set for which uncertainties on the predictions were higher for magnitude around eight. This is important because this real data has never been seen by the model and it means that our a uh, database of synthetic waveforms with empirical noise is, uh, um, can reproduce uh, or it's similar to what is observed on uh, real data. So in conclusion, uh, we have shown that our deep learning model is able to estimate magnitudes uh, for uh, shallow deep sleep uh, events, uh, large events, uh, above roughly 7.88. We have shown that predictions errors uh, decrease as a function of magnitude, and this could play a critical role in the context of early warning systems, helping to overcome the current limitations of uh, point source algorithms for early magnitude estimation. Uh, at the moment, uh, we required 315 seconds of uh, recordings after the earthquake origin time, but this can be reduced by restricting the spatial location of the sources. Uh, for Toku, this can be reduced to about uh, 2.5 minutes, uh, which is the arrival time of the P-Wave at the farthest station in our network. 
the model is yet not uh, directly applicable to early warning application, but this time scale would place our model in the context of uh, tsunami early warning systems, where estimating magnitudes of uh, very large earthquakes uh, within a few minutes is vital. The model is easily ap applicable to different focal mechanisms and uh, geographic regions, conditional on training, of course, and uh, the noising through autoencoders can be applied to the input data in the attempt to increase even more the signal-to-noise ratio and improve uh, magnitude estimation. Thank you.